Hi, this is Kelly from Live with the Horticulturist. Today I wanted to show you two plant options to buy for Valentine's Day. The first one is Cyclamen. It has these cute little heart-shaped leaves. It comes in colors of red, pink, and white, and they usually last about six weeks. I water it in my sink and allow the water to drain out the bottom, or I will put it in a bucket of water and allow the root ball to take the water up. These plants thrive in cooler temperatures. So away from a heating vent would be the most ideal place to display it. You can get these to rebloom by withholding light and water for two months. However, I consider it a flower arrangement with roots and go ahead and toss it away. A more permanent plant is the Phalaenopsis orchid, also called moth orchid. These bloom for about eight weeks, sometimes more. They like high humidity, so a bathroom or a kitchen would be the most ideal place to put them in your home. I water the orchids in the sink also, allowing the water to come out the bottom. I never, never allow the water to be sitting or the roots to sit in water. As a houseplant, they love bright light, which is about 12 to 36 inches from your south facing window. Um, once it warms up, you can put them outside and start fertilizing them regularly. Um, it's being consistent with the light, the watering, the fertilizing, and temperatures being lower during the night that will get this Phalaenopsis orchid to rebloom. Hi, this is Kelly from Live with the Horticulturist. Today I wanted to show you how to extend the life of your floral design. First, it's really important to change the water daily as bacteria starts to build up and that clogs the stems, preventing the flower's ability to take up water. Use that floral preservative package that comes with nearly all flower arrangements. However, if you change the water daily, you will need to learn to make your own. That floral preservative package usually contains sugar, citric acid, and bleach. So we are going to take a quart of warm water. The warm water will help dissolve the sugar and aid in better water uptake. We're gonna use one teaspoon of sugar to feed the flour, one teaspoon of bleach to kill that bacteria, and two teaspoons of lemon juice to lower the pH of the water, aiding in better, better water uptake. Once I've made the solution, I'm ready to put my flowers in. But one last step that I always take is to recut the stems of my flowers underwater. This will prevent air bubbles from clogging the stem. I usually do it in a bowl, just recut my stems and add it to my flower arrangement. I hope this tip was helpful and your flower arrangement lasts a really long time. Hello everyone and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions on a special Valentine's Day themed episode today. Uh, my name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist running the Master Gardener Program here for the state. And I tend to focus on um, flowers, so annuals, perennials, landscaping. That tends to be my favorite um, thing to answer, but we also have some other great horticulturists here today who enjoy other topics to talk about. So I'm going to kick it over to them for intros and to get us kicked off. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Alsup. I'm a, a horticulture educator based out of Bloomington. Um, my specialty within the team is integrated pest management, which means I like looking for the bad bugs and the good bugs. Um, I am passionate about trees and vegetable gardening, 
But uh, what really lends me well to this episode is because I used to work in greenhouses and I used to grow all these flowering plants that you guys are going to be buying for the Valentine's Day holiday. So um, I know a little bit about getting them to flower and taking care of them. And I'm Ryan Pankow, horticulture educator out of Champaign County, and my specialty is trees and shrubs and native plants. That's I've spent a lot of time doing restoration type work in the past before coming to Extension. And as a second love in the gardening world, I like to grow a lot of vegetables. Kelly and I both have a big, a big passion for vegetable gardening, so that's kind of another area of interest of ours. But um, with that, I guess we could kind of kick off the show today. Um, I was going to talk about, uh, to kind of start things off here, I was going to talk about some alternatives to cut flowers. So um, while a flower arrangement is beautiful and wonderful, what are some things that could last a little longer? And so houseplants are one of my favorites. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen here to talk about a few um, houseplants that I enjoy. Um, okay, Kelly, can you guys see my We my can see here? you. Yep, perfect. Um, yep. You getting the main screen? Okay. And no, we're seeing the uh, presenter view. Let me get full okay. screen. Yeah. Swap presenter view. Okay, perfect. there we go. Um, so this is so I'd like to talk about is some pretty common house plants uh, going from pretty easy care to more difficult care. So this snake plant, uh, well, and also a few common house plants just kind of a little different variety of each as we're kind of going through these. So this is snake plant, really common house plant. Um, a lot of us have, and this variety of Laurenti has these beautiful little yellow leaf margins. So I, this is uh, one that we, I forget where we even got this plant. We've had it for a while, uh, but super easy to take care of plant uh, really can just have next to no light almost and do fine. It probably doesn't grow quite as fast when it doesn't have light, but uh, can get to be sizable, you know, about three feet tall or so, and has these kind of, you know, it's it's mainly for its foliage that we grow this plant. It's not a flowering plant. Um, rarely flowers in um, house plant production means, but um, can be can actually flower. Some people have reported that at times. Uh, low maintenance, uh, low low soil moisture. Like I barely water this plant. It's you know kind of the last on my list of water plants that we water around my place. So just a great one for. Uh, somebody that's maybe a beginning gardener or somebody that doesn't have a lot of high light uh, areas for plants. Um, okay, so the next one, we've probably all seen spider plant before, you know, with the dangly little spiders that hang down, which, which are actually little runners. Uh, but this version, this variety, Bonnie, is kind of has these thick curly leaves and just, I think, uh, very beautiful variegation on those leaves. So, this is just kind of one of my favorite plants we've got in the last couple of years. It's just kind of a different spin on the common uh, spider plant. So uh, I put this a little, not as the easiest because it does require a little bit more watering uh, than snake plant would require. It's not a real finicky plant with watering, but um, requires just a little bit more, uh, probably not direct sunlight, but um, indirect, you know, bright light is what it would like. Um, and I also put on here, it's, it's easy to propagate. This is a fun one to propagate babies of. You can take the quote unquote spiders that grow off, that dangle down off of it, and they root very easily. So a good one for kind of intermediate, if somebody does have a spot with a little bit more light than maybe snake plant would support. Um, and so, uh, and just a different spin on kind of one of those common house plants we see a lot. Um, this one is pencil cactus, and you can see Kelly has a huge one behind her. Um, and this fire sticks variety, you can see in the middle picture there, has this beautiful pink color on the tips. Um, so uh, you can see my fire sticks variety at the left there does not have the pink. And that's because I wasn't able to give this plant enough light. It really needs full sunlight. It needs bright, you know, pretty good sunlight to keep that pink color. But it's this, it was super beautiful when we got it with really a lot of that pink color on the tips. Um, and now it's kind of faded. I, I put this as a little bit more difficult to care for just because it takes really good light. And I know if, if you guys have had many houseplants over the years, that's always the, the thing at my house is like those key windows with good light. It's a really careful selection of what plants go there. Unfortunately, you know, we talked about last week, I've really been into my jade plants lately. My jade plants are taking up a lot of that full sun space. So <laughs> poor pencil cactus is off to the side. There's a, there's a window right to the right of it that's really bright there that you can... Can't quite see, but um, 
really kind of a low maintenance plant other than the light requirements. You know, it's a succulent. It's not going to take a lot of watering. Probably overwatering is one of the biggest mistakes with this plant. Um, and so the only other thing I would maybe caution you all on is that it can get big. I mean, they I, I saw one at a local garden center that was probably the full almost six feet tall, and I, I'd hate to guess how old it was. So maybe if there was any maintenance to this plant, it's a little bit of pruning, and I've kind of snipped around on ours over the years to kind of keep it a little bit smaller just to maintain it in that smaller pot. And finally, the last one I'd like to touch on here are just orchids in general. And I think this is a, this is a plant I get a question about, questions about a lot from folks. And uh, the reason being, it's it's they're just all over the place. I mean, you can see them everywhere from the supermarket checkout line to garden stores and other places. And they're always in full beautiful bloom, you know, for everybody to see. Well, uh, I'm definitely not going to claim to be an orchid expert. I think after this, Kelly's going to give you a little more expert advice on orchid care and things. But in my experience, I can keep them alive, and we have a we have quite a few orchids around our house alive, but. It's tricky to get them to rebloom, and I guess what I found is it's just finding that exact like right spot of light in whatever room it is for these plants. Um, so I always like to kind of warn folks: if you're looking for a good house plant gift for an inexperienced gardener, don't just pick up that blooming orchid at the checkout lane. It's going to be beautiful for a, a, a short time while it's blooming, and then may never bloom again for that inexperienced gardener. But um, on the same note, it kind of makes a great gift for an experienced gardener. So for somebody like Kelly, this would be an awesome. Awesome Valentine's Day gift because she would know how to take care of it. Bring it on. Um, anyway, <laughs> so I'll stop my screen share there um, and flip, switch to you, Kelly, for some tips on how to take care of stuff. Nice. And feel free, you guys, to start um, adding your questions into the comment box. If you have questions about anything we're talking today or any gardening topic, feel free to start adding them and we'll get them as we go through. Yeah, um, actually, um, back uh, when Candace was in grad, stu grad student, um, she helped me in the greenhouse and I was, uh, I ran a portion of the greenhouse and we actually did some kinds of experimentations on orchids. And I do think that they can be difficult to rebloom. I mean, they really need like the optimal light, the optimal water and the optimal fertilizer and temperatures and this like perfect combination in order to get them re -bloom, to rebloom. And um, one of the things that we did is, you know, we had a greenhouse, so I'm sorry. <laughs> we beat you on that, <laughs> beat you with the window on that. Only. <laughs> so we had wonderful light. And then we um, did um, regular weekly fertilizers. And um, we uh, were really careful with the watering, not to overwater, but to not to let them dry out too much. And so we were able to get a lot more blooms on them. Um, so here is an orchid that I bought from a grocery center, and I just wanted to explain, um, you know, one thing, uh, you know, it's not, not only the optimal light, water, and temperature, but sometimes it is the difference between the day and the night temperature that triggers orchids to bloom. Uh -huh. And I've been able to do some of that in my home because if I have this next to my south window, we know that in the winter, the window might bring in a little bit, it might stay a little bit cooler. And so I felt like that was what made it more successful for me. But one of the things that you see is you always see orchids come in a clear pot. Say, so what is this? Why is it in a clear pot? That is because the roots of an orchid photosynthesize also. And so they, the growers, would never grow them in a pot like this. Now, you're not going to buy it if it's not pretty, right? But, you know, so for a little bit, it's fine to keep it in this pot as a display, but eventually you want to get it out. And when you, uh, you know, treat it as a house plant, you're going to want those roots to be able to photosynthesize too. This is not always ideal. Um, I usually, um, you know, sit here and um, really, you um, I like to saturate the soil and let it run out the bottom. I would never water in this pot. Never, never, never. Because roots, those roots cannot sit in water. Even if just for a little bit, it will kill them out. But 
I do sometimes, con Ryan, consider uh, Phalaenopsis orchids as kind of a flower arrangement with roots. Like uh -huh. once it, it blooms for eight weeks, sometimes longer. So once, you know, that's a pretty long flower arrangement. And once you're done, you could potentially give it to that more gardening friend. But still, um, for the price, eight weeks of bloom, totally worth it. But, yeah, they uh, are really affordable. I, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised how cheap they are on the checkout line with, you know, 10 awesome flowers on it. Yeah. You met, so you mentioned the temperature difference, Kelly. I've had really good luck treating those um, orchids as an outdoor plant for the summer. So mm -hmm. I'll have them as a house plant, of course, through the winter. And then once it's once in spring, it's warm enough, I'll take them outside, put them on my uh, back deck. Not in a full sun location, more of a filtered kind of shade mm -hmm. spot. Um, and I find that to be the simplest way to get them to rebloom because outside they're naturally getting that 10 degree night day difference. Mm -hmm. When you have them in the house, your temperature is just not fluctuating enough in a normal th home thermostat. So I find that to be the simplest way to do it. Well, that's a really cool point. I mean, I've I've never had the guts to put mine outside. I felt <laughs> like they were they're too sensitive. But yeah, that's yeah. use nature. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think another aspect of it all is. Um, the relative humidity in your home too. Mm -hmm. And I know mine gets like just super dry this time of year where I think if you looked up the requirements, orchids would take about double the humidity that my, you know, my home at 20 to 30% humidity is going to dry them out. So uh, that mm -hmm. picture of the dancing lady orchid, that takes a little more relative humidity. So we have that hanging in our bathroom, mm -hmm. um, you nice. know, to kind of capture all the shower steam and everything. And it, it seems to like a little more humidity there, but. That's a really good tip. Um, yeah, we we definitely don't have humidity in our homes here in Illinois. And, you know, we tell you to back off of the watering a little bit during the winter times because that plant is not actively growing. Yet, because of the heat, you're pulling all that moisture out of the soil. So you still need to think about watering your plants and checking them and not just totally neglecting them during the winter because they are, all that water is being stolen from the surrounding dry air. So yes. I just wanted to show you, cyclamens are a big one. I always call this one a flower arrangement with roots because you can get it to rebloom, but you have to force it into dormancy first. So I just considered it a flower arrangement with roots. <laughs> Candace is the same way. Yeah. Um, and I, I've worked at um, floral designers during graduate school, and we were uh, particular in how we were watering um, these uh, flowering plants. Now, we would never water in this pot, and we wouldn't even take this pot out and water and let it drain through, but we would bottom water. And the reason we bottom water is because the worst thing you can do for this plant is over or under. So if you were to just pour water in there, you want to make sure it's super saturated. So what I do is I'm just demonstrating here. We use buckets. You see how there's water in the bottom is I'm just I would do this with my sink or a bucket and I would just set this in and allow it to soak up the water. And then once it got fully saturated, then I'd set it on a paper towel for a little bit and then put it back in its decorative pot. I know you're like, oh, Kelly, do I really have to go through all that work? You do if you want to save the roots. Yeah. If you want it to last as long as you possibly can and you don't want it under or over water, which will kill it right away, um, this is a really great way. Even though it's got a plastic liner in there, it's still, oh, it kind of kills me a little bit. Would you agree that even though these are beautiful and these are, make great gifts, they are not great for plants? No, not in the long term, at least. Yeah, for sure. Well, and you're also keeping the foliage dry and you're keeping the flowers dry, which is going to help, especially the flowers, can help lengthen the life of the flowers too, if you're keeping them well, and, dry. Well, I would say, I would say I've probably spent more money on pots mm -hmm. than I've spent on the actual house plants. You know, the pots are kind of expensive for a nice one. That yeah, and it's usually what they sell. What they sell to, sell sell them in are just looking nice. You know, not necessarily a nice pot for the long term. But yeah, the key is that drainage hole. So if the, if that pot, if that decorative pot doesn't have a drainage hole, you definitely need to treat it like that cyclamen and keep it in its own pot that you can pull out water and then put back in. 
And Ryan, don't you hate it when you're in a garden center and you pick out the perfect color and style of pot and it doesn't have a hole in the pot? <laughs> Well, I've like, put holes in some bottoms of pots. That's true. <laughs> well, a drill. Is, is there's not a price on it. And you go ask, and it's like, oh, that's a $65 pot. You know, I just can't ever bring myself to spend a bunch of money on a pot. So I'm always, it's one of the things in the garden center I'm always looking for is like some fancy pot that's on sale, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, I like to hit up cheap if you watch. I like to hit up the thrift stores, look for secondhand. Yeah, <laughs> I like or, garage sales. Yeah. yeah, garage sales, estate sales. I think we've got like half our orchid collection from estate sales, which is kind Ooh, of cool. nice. Um, but yeah, we've got some cool pots over the years at estate sales. So yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, if you guys have questions uh, about this, we're talking about kind of holiday gift plants that would be great to give and plant care, add them to the comments. Or if you have any other gardening questions this time of year, we're happy to um, happy to chat. Yeah. Um, okay, so did we kind of cover our, our bases on the the plants, you think? Anything else we want to touch on there? Pretty good. I mean, unless people have further questions. I mean, I did touch on a little bit of care during the video, and we have a, 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 a news release about some other um, flowering plants, and then we have Ryan's um, list of plants he thinks people should get. I love Ryan's list. I, I think house plants are big. I think it's fun mm -hmm. to take care of them. And, um, you know, imagine, you know, not only are you giving, you know, this could go back to Candace and I's article of why to buy flowers if they're just going to die. Mm -hmm. And I think we both cringe when people say this. Uh -huh. Because we absolutely love flowers and we see the benefit of them. And so um, I don't know a single person that cannot remember exactly the last time they got flowers from someone, who it was from and how it made them feel. And so it really is quite a rewarding feeling. I love it when people send me flowers, it doesn't matter if they're orchids or carnations. I'm just, I'm thrilled. It makes me feel good. And, you know, when you think about flower arrangements, you have this beautiful flower arrangement. How many times in a day do you look at that flower arrangement and feel that feeling? Uh -huh. So I think and Candace can add on to this. I think that's why I cringe when people say, why would you buy flowers if they're just going to die? Because they have an emotional um, attachment to them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we are, we'll get that link to your article. I think you mentioned it in there. There's scientific studies that, that prove that fact that, that flowers really do change the your emotional kind of feeling. So I think that's pretty amazing that just a simple gift of a, a beautiful arrangement of flowers can make that that kind of impact. It's pretty amazing. Okay, I think we had a couple questions here. So let me check those before we... Um, yeah, Gabrielle commented. She said, I'd much rather get a flower, some sort of plant that I can actually plant... Um, She's saying she'd rather get a plant so she can have it last for a long time. We totally agree. Love plants as gifts. And let's see, Goo, here's an insect question for you. Um, I'm trying to keep herbs in my southern exposure sunroom. Um, I keep getting little bugs and spider webs on them. Um, is neem oil poisonous or not? Can I use it on my herbs? So insect expert Kelly. Well, it sounds like... You know, my first instinct would have been fungus gnats because that tends to be what we get in the winter. But if you got spider webs on them, you got spider mites. Uh -huh. And um, that may be a little difficult to control. Um, you can use neem oil on spider mites. Um, but um, if it was like a really heavy population of spider mites, I would throw them all away and start over. Um, just not going to be worth that battle when you can, when herbs are so easy to grow and start over. And we do this a lot of times, you know, I had, um, you know, during the first part of the pandemic, I had, my office is full of plants and um, I had a mealybug outbreak in a lot of my plants. And so rather than uh, bite the bullet and start spraying them, I just threw them away and said, I just want to have clean for the rest because I have a lot of succulents that I'm really in love with. 
So sometimes that's a challenge for me. I want, sometimes I want people to just, you know, you're going to eat these herbs. Let's just not spray. Yeah, I know neem oil is organic, but uh, another thing is, you know, spider mites thrive in dry, hot, dry conditions. Um, you could change your culture a little bit, maybe um, spritzing the plants a little bit more. Really, really clean up everything because those spider mites are going to be everywhere. Um, you know, I mean, I think go back to the greenhouse, Candace and I would have spider mite infestations. We would have to really clean that room. We'd have to clean out those plants and we'd have to crank up that temperature for a little bit to uh, eradicate it. But I don't know. I don't know if I was long winded on that answer. What do you think, Candace? No, I concur. That's exactly what I was going to say. So for something with herbs where you can grow them so quickly from seed I would do the same thing, just kind of start fresh and then do something to try to increase the humidity uh, in that area and, and hope for the best in the next round. And definitely scout out other plants. What mm -hmm. if it's a house plant that is the source of all those spider mites? Um, you would want to get rid of that plant immediately. Um, yeah. And they and should look on the underside of the leaf would be the best yes. place to scout, correct? Yes. And in normal, you know, normally if we were in the middle of summer, I would just tell you to put it outside mm -hmm. because beneficial insects would come in and take care of the problem for you most likely. And we don't usually deal with spider mites outside. It's only inside that it becomes a huge issue. Mm -hmm. Well, so another thought on the replacement of those plants is one thing I've noticed in recent years is the grocery supermarket uh, produce section a, a lot of times has little pots of herbs. So maybe you can start with some little starts uh, mm -hmm. from there to get them replaced. Absolutely. Okay, let's see. Bo uh, Deb also commented she loves bulbs. Having a hyacinth in her kitchen makes her happy, and then she can plant them in the garden the next year. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, let's see, a question here from Deb. Uh, my amaryllis did not bloom. I bought the same product I always do. Is there any chance it will do anything this year? It has big leaves and it was planted in November. We were going to touch on amaryllis, so that's a great question. Mm -hmm. How did I grow a lot of amaryllis? <laughs> um, is, it, is it possible, Candace, that the bulb wasn't pre-cooled? That would be my guess, yeah, is that it, the bulb just wasn't uh, prepared correctly for it to bloom for you right away. Yeah. Because when you think about amaryllis, let me tell you how I grew them in the greenhouse. Um, I grew them throughout the uh, the spring and the early part of the summer. I just grew them like a house plant. I regularly watered them. I regularly fertilized them. But then um, I had to time them for the floral design class, their topiary demonstration. And so I needed them for a particular, you know, date. Mm -hmm. Of course, the teacher would work with me if I wasn't perfect on the date. So I, at the end of the summer, what I did is I forced them into dormancy, which means I put them on their side, withheld water, withheld light, and put them in a cooler location than the greenhouse actually provided. So this for me was, you know, a little, uh, a little shed that we had connected to the greenhouse. And then about six to eight weeks before I needed those flowers for that class, I would pull them out. And sometimes I would pot them up. Sometimes I wouldn't. But some, I would never pot them up too big. I mean, they definitely want to be in smaller pots and um, not have too much room. Mm -hmm. And then in about eight weeks after I started forcing them, I'd get that bloom come up. And then after the bloom, then I'd start to get the leaf growth. So the fact that you're getting leaf growth makes me think that you're not going to get a flower this yeah. year. You don't always have to do that particular strategy of forcing dormancy because I know a lot of um, you know gardeners or who don't do that and it still reblooms. But that's how I scheduled the rebloom. Mm -hmm. I would, all of you that have amaryllises that are no longer blooming, cut that bloom off, start treating it like a house plant, and start thinking about um, how how you want to where you're going to force it into dormancy. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I would suggest too. I actually had a, 
a pot that I had put in a cabinet in the garage to, to give it that dark and cool period uh, this last year. I actually forgot about it and found it probably in about April, I think. So I pulled it out, uh, put it on my front porch, started to treat it kind of as an outdoor house plant, essentially. And I had amaryllis blooms in June, which was a nice little, nice little treat for the summer. So that's what I think is nice is that you can do it any time of year, really, with that forcing technique. And most, which I'm surprised, most of the things, if you get those amaryllis bulbs in the industry, most of the time they're already ready yeah. to bloom. Yeah. They've been, uh, they've been either pre-cooled or pre-dormant. Mm -hmm. And so you plant it up six weeks later, you're probably going to have a bloom. And you can still do that now, you guys. We're, just because amaryllis is traditionally linked to the Christmas holiday season doesn't mean it can't be an awesome blooming plant. I mean, that is a gorgeous bloom mm -hmm. to have in your wow. house. Love and amaryllis. Yeah. Nothing like it, really. Mm -hmm. yeah, really, any time of year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. Cool. Great questions. Keep those questions coming. If you've got uh, questions about anything we're talking about today or any gardening content, we're happy to happy to chat. But let's start, I think, talking... Um, Switching gears, talk a little bit more about cut flowers. We talked a lot about blooming plants as gift, but let's talk about cut flowers because uh, let's be honest, Valentine's Day is a big cut flower holiday for us uh, florists. This is the the Super Bowl essentially between this and Mother's Day. Those are the big flower uh, occasions. So. Uh, thank your local florists because they are busy uh, <laughs> this week. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, flower care. Um, if after this live show ends you're, and you join us late, you're welcome to come back to the Facebook page and, and replay this Facebook Live because we shared some uh, great videos that Kelly created uh, at the start of the show. So you can always go back and watch those um, later. Um, but yeah, Kelly, let's talk about cut flower care. And then I'm going to, I think, uh, demo kind of a, a, a little arrangement as we uh, as we do that. So let me push right. my camera back here and get get set up there. Okay, so let's say you received a um, a bouquet of flowers for Valentine's Day. Maybe you didn't get it in, uh, in a vase already, and you already have a, a vase at home. That's a great way to to get flowers. Is just get a wrapped bouquet. Um, the key when you're making any vase arrangement is to make sure that you don't have uh, leaves that are going to be in the water. So anytime you get an arrangement or making an arrangement, you always want to have nice, clean cut stems that are going to be down in the water. Because what we're trying to fight in terms of keeping flowers alive for a long time is bacteria. And anytime you have foliage in the water means that you're going to have bacteria start to grow on those um, stems. So that's one of the first big tips is to make sure that your all of your stems are clean. So that means kind of stripping off uh, any leaves, anything like that before it goes in a vase. That's going to be uh, key there. And grab my drop my knife. And you can, of course, cut your stems with um, clippers and it, I wouldn't, the only thing we usually don't recommend is scissors because they're just not sharp enough to give a nice clean um, cut. Um, since I do a lot of arrangement, I, I use a knife when I do it so that it's always just in my hand, but at home uh, instead of pruners, it's great. And Kelly, feel free to... And you see that she's using a florist knife. Now that's something that me, not a florist, would never use. It's not, it's a tool that she has perfected. I use clippers. Yeah. And um, notice that she's recutting the stems before she puts them in water. So she's opening back up those stems. And because she's recut them, they're going to take up more water. So even though it might be a pain to recut them, it really does help. Um, those are going to suck up a lot of water in the first, you know, 24 hours as she's going. Yeah. And that's why you'll hear us say a lot of times to uh, change out the water frequently to keep the water clean, but then also to give a fresh, clean cut to those uh, stems. Because what's going to happen over time is that that cut is just going to kind of callous over. So if you look at 
um, some of these rose stems here. You probably won't be able to see it well, but you can even tell just by looking at the end of the stem that it's pretty calloused over. Like, so that tells me that there's not going to be a whole lot of water absorption, new water absorption happening uh, in that stem. So a fresh, clean cut is going to go uh, a long way. Okay. So yeah. anytime you're, oh, go ahead, Kelly. No, no, no. I was going to say, anytime you're making a, a vase arrangement, uh, the first thing that most of us florists and it's typically recommended to start with is the greenery, okay? Because what we're trying to do is essentially kind of create a grid system, a grid work inside that vase so that when I add, start adding flowers later on, they're going to stay where I put them. They're going to be kind of held uh, in place. So I have some, uh, this wider leaf is called a salal or lemon leaf, and I'm going to add some eucalyptus here too. Okay, and remember, I'm stripping off all that foliage so I have nice clean stems. Bonus of eucalyptus, your hands are going to smell real nice after that as well. Okay. And so I like I'm, the mixing of the greens. It's the mixing of the greens that makes it feel a little bit more high end for me. Yeah, yeah, that's always what I like to do too because it just gives it more texture and color and movement when you have multiple kinds of uh, greens in there. Okay, so what you'll notice, it's kind of hard to see in this space then, but what you'll start to see is that your stems are going to start to crisscross inside that vase and you're forming kind of this grid system that's going to help hold our flowers. Uh, the other thing to note too is height. So this vase is probably, I don't know, six inches or so tall. And when we're talking about proportions in a vase arrangement, we want about a one-to-one -one proportion. So I don't want to have 12 inches of, of material up here in a, in a shorter kind of vase. I want it to be about the same height as my vase. And that's going to be the most balanced um, visually. So this one's a little bit taller than one-to-one, -one, but that's kind of the idea that you're going for. Okay, so you start with your greens, get a good kind of grid system going, and then you can start adding your um, flowers. And the way that I like to uh, do that is to start with kind of a, a ring of flowers around the base, kind of shorter stems, and then work your way up to those taller stems uh, in the middle. So I'm going to start with some um, carnations here, and I'm going to cut them. I'm going to strip off any of these little leaves that are lingering. I and noticed then, your vase has kind of like that retro old fashioned feel. Do you find that that is a, a trend this year for the holiday? Yeah, I think any kind of textured, a uh, little bit more of an upscale vase, I think is definitely in than your typical, just kind of plain, clear, uh, clear vase, I think is always, it's is always it, good. Yeah, it seems like in the industry, all we used was the clear vase. That was the high end. And now mm -hmm. it's like everything looks a little bit more like it could have come from grandma's vase collection. So I kind of like it, though. I yeah, like it. me too. Yeah. So as you can see, I'm adding those carnations in kind of lower towards the edge of the vase a little bit more to kind of get that base um, started. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and start adding some, a few roses at that level as well. And carnations and roses really last a long time in a vase, correct? Oh, yeah, for sure. Especially if you're cleaning the water, given that fresh cut. Um, and, and sometimes you're going to have maybe some damaged petals on that flower, and that's okay. A lot of times you're going to have those guard petals around the outside. So what you can do is just kind of pluck off those uh, outer petals and just toss those, no worries, no worries there. And that flower will continue to open up throughout the life of that yeah. vase arrangement and take up more space. Yeah, absolutely. So if you get a, let's say you get a dozen roses uh, this week for Valentine's Day and you're like, oh, these are small flowers. They're pretty, pretty tight. They, that may look a little odd now, but that's actually what you're going to want in the long term, because that means that those are nice and fresh. And as time goes on, those flowers are just going to keep open and, and open for you. If I was doing these roses for, let's say, a wedding, I would actually get the roses in earlier in the week and allow them to really open nice and full and use them for something like that, because they don't need to last as long if it's a kind of a one-day occasion. But with a vase arrangement, you want it to last 
a long time. Yeah. So let's say you're in a supermarket and you're picking out some uh, a dozen roses for the love of your life. Mm -hmm. How would they choose the roses that they want? So look, I'll, overall, you want to look at, see kind of how healthy that that rose looks. You want to give it a squeeze, okay? A, a healthy, fresh rose is going to feel pretty firm uh, at the base when you squeeze it. If it feels soft at all, if it's kind of bending over, it's looking a little sad, um, something like that. A lot of times you can give it a fresh cut and it will it will refresh itself. But if you're buying them, you want a nice, firm um, looking flower. Like I mentioned, there might be some um, outer petal damage um, you can remove that easily. So that's not a huge deal. That just happens kind of in, uh, in shipment. But yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is to, to feel if they're nice and firm, if there's not a lot of kind of damage to the, to the petals, that's good to, to look for as well. But yeah, if you're buying from a, a local florist, they're going to put in that work for you to remove those ugly petals and make sure everything is processed, uh, process well. Um, grocery store flowers, uh, hey, any way you can get flowers, I'm all for it. <laughs> so, but just like I said, give them that inspection to make sure what you're buying is still looking fresh. It hasn't been out of the cooler for uh, for days and days. Um, when you buy flowers from a, a florist or anybody that has a floral section, uh, they're going to have a, a cooler that they can keep those flowers in until you purchase them or until they deliver them so that they can stay as cool and fresh as, as possible. When they're sitting out on the shelf, sometimes you really don't know how long, how long they've been out there. So there's been, uh, you know, when we think about flowers for uh, Valentine's Day, it's always the 12 dozen ro long stem red roses. Have you seen any change in that, or is that still what we are traditionally doing for Valentine's Day, or are we mixing it up? I think there's some mixing it up. I think it depends who's ordering it. I think if it's a if it's a guy ordering it, then I think the the dozen red roses is still the is still the go to because I mean you can't you kind of can't go wrong. Uh, but I think over time they also learn kind of what their their Valentine likes, <laughs> um, and then you definitely kind of get. Uh, more assortment in there. I tend to do a lot of uh, kind of designer's choice arrangements, which to me is a lot of times the best way to go if you are ordering flowers, um, because that gives some leeway to the designer to pick what looks the best, what's the freshest, what's gonna be a great color combination. And you might even get more bang for your buck because uh, red roses are in demand. So the price of red roses is going to be higher on Valentine's Day because of demand. So if you have some flexibility uh, to choose some other things, then yeah, I think give that give that florist the leeway to make up something special uh, for you. And you guys love it when they let you be Oh yeah, the creator, right? For sure. We, that's what a designer lives for. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. Another so, another thing that I constantly go ahead. Did I need no. another thing that I constantly balk at when it comes to flower arrangements is that you can't give a flower arrangement to a guy. And I'm just like, why is that? Yeah. And so one year um, I asked my father, I said, have you ever received a flower arrangement before? And he said, no. And he's about as manly as you can get. <laughs> and, but he loves horticulture. He loves plants. He loves flowers. Clearly, I'm his daughter. Mm -hmm. And so um, the last like several years of his life for his birthday and for Valentine's Day, I always sent him flower arrangement and he loved it. Nice. Now, Ryan, would you be OK if Amanda sent you uh, a flower arrangement? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, I. I, uh, I mean, I cut them out of our yard just every once in a while when I see something that's got a lot of flowers on it, I'll bring some in just for something cool for us to look at inside and during the growing season. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm into it. I would, I'd love to get flowers. Have you ever gotten flowers before? Uh, I have to, I don't think I have. I, I mean, I've given flowers a lot of times of and I, <laughs> I, I like letting the florist pick. That's how I usually do it because mm -hmm. I, I don't have a lot of preference and i feel like just like candace said i feel like i get the best 
arrangement for the buck mm -hmm. that way. But, um, but yeah, I can't say that I've ever got flowers. Um, I mean, the, old, the biggest uh, interaction I think I can kind of remember is our wedding. You know, we obviously had a lot of flowers at it and things. And I, I had opinions on that. Like my, my wife and I both really liked hydrangeas, which, you know, are fairly expensive cut flowers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but that was an important thing for us. We wanted to have those in a lot of the different arrangements. So that's probably the biggest like flower detail I can remember from my uh, cut flower detail from my past. Uh, but yeah, that's interesting. And maybe that is um, a gift that we should consider more for, for guys. Yeah, I think guys love flowers as much as women do, and it's not, it doesn't have to necessarily be designated for women. Yeah, and, and you can tell the florist that this is for a male, so you can make it a little bit more masculine by changing up the colors. I like to add a lot of different greenery and textures and succulents and stuff like that for a, a masculine arrangement. So, yeah, absolutely, for sure. So show us your arrangement. Okay, yeah. so the last the last thing I did was I added some filler. That's typically kind of the last thing you're going to add in. So this is wax flower, one of my favorite um, fillers. So I'll, if you stand back, like I said, proportion-wise, we want it to be about one-to-one. -one. Uh, we started kind of with those shorter stems towards the, the edge of the vase. And I might even go back and add a little bit more greenery kind of to cover the edge of the vase a little bit more. Um, but yeah, started with the shorter things and then started to work up to kind of those taller things towards the top. Um, yeah. And then the nice thing about a, a vase arrangement like this is, let me tilt this back down. Um, uh, it's really easy to change out that water and keep things fresh. So what you can do is just take your hands at the base, pull those stems out and hold them like a bouquet, basically. And then what you can do every day is that you can uh, dump that water out, start with fresh, cool, uh, clean water, add your flower food, pack it in there. And then again, you can recut those stems and then just drop it right back in. So don't be afraid to uh, take things out of the vase, lift it out and drop it back in. If it's a well-constructed vase arrangement, then it's going to look... So Candace, I, I noticed your vase is really full of water. And I guess maybe that's a mistake I've made is I'm, I'm only putting it in the the bottom part where the cuts cut stems are, but is it, does it matter? If I you know, it does. It, obviously that's where your water absorption is going to be happen is in those cut stems. But I usually still recommend filling it almost to the top, just in case you forget that next day to check it. Um, a lot of people don't think about it. Oh, I, I need to clean the water today. Uh, and if they don't, and then those flowers are going to drink up quite a bit of water. So I still like to go ahead and fill it pretty high. Um, and then remember, like I said before, the key is that there's no foliage in that water. So if I need to kind of pull this out again and make sure all of these stems are nice and clean, I can do that because that's going to keep that uh, bacteria from growing in there. Yeah. And you think about when you're watering your Christmas tree, Ryan, you fill yeah. that baby up, right? Because you cannot let that Christmas tree go dry or it'll stop dry, start dropping leaves. And if these if the, the water is out of these, they're, they're done. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And that's a good, and that brings up a good point. Um, if you do, let's say you have a rose in a, in a vase like this and you come back the next day and it's looking pretty sad, it's kind of flopping over or Brian, you mentioned hydrangea. A lot of times if it's not too far gone, you can rehydrate um, things. So if it was a rose like that, what I would do is I would pull it out of the, the vase. I would give it a clean, fresh cut. And then what I would actually do is fill the sink with warm water and I would lay the, the flower horizontally after I make that clean cut. And just let it soak in that warm water for a period of time. Because a lot of times the reason it's bending over like that is because there's an air pocket in the stem and it's not able to uptake water. So if you recut it, lay it horizontal, uh, let that water kind of infiltrate. A lot of times it'll perk back up and you can put it back in your uh, your vase then. Yeah. And that's how I've like, when I cut hydrangeas from the landscape, I let them soak in that water. That's what you do too, Candace. when it Yeah, comes absolutely. To hydrangeas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you get that wilted hydrangea uh, stem, these hydrangeas will actually absorb a lot of water through the flower head itself. So you can submerge the whole uh, stem and really help um, 
get it back. Yeah, that's, a, it that's again. a great tip. I never do that. I just yeah. cut them and stick them in water. So nice. Well, so uh, beyond the fun of just arranging that uh, arrangement yourself, Candice, is it is it cost effective to buy all those different parts and put them together yourself? Are you saving money or is it cheaper to buy the thing already put together? What What's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it can definitely be less expensive to purchase that wrapped bouquet uh, from the florist as opposed to that bouquet already in a vase because obviously you're paying for less, less labor. You're not paying for the vase. So typically it is a little less expensive to get that mixed mixed bouquet that you can arrange yourself. Um, and I think that's, obviously I'm a designer, so I love it, but I think that's the fun part of it too, is being able to create something yourself uh, with it as well. Now, guys, make sure that's what your lady wants. Okay, not every lady's gonna wanna have to arrange their own flowers. Uh, sometimes it's nice to give them that pre-made thing, but yeah, I think it's it's nice to be able to uh, get a, maybe a little less expensive wrapped bouquet and kind of arrange it yourself. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to check back here for questions. And then I do want to touch on um, flower care a little bit more. Uh, Amy asked, can you please give flower preservative recipe? And that's an excellent question. So your florist is typically going to give you at least one of these flower preservative packets, um, which are great to use. You can look on the back. It'll tell you how much water uh, to put in. And if you need extra, most of the time they'd be happy to give you extra uh, flower food packets. If you don't have it, what this contains is um, sugars for to feed the flowers. It contains an acidifier to keep the pH low in the water and it creates, and it also contains a bacteria side to help keep the bacteria also from growing in the water. So to be honest, if you could do one thing to keep your flowers alive for the longest, it would be to just change the water daily. Whether you have flower food or not, fresh water is going to be the biggest thing to keep the bacteria away. Next would then be to add the flower food. And if you don't have that at home, just think about what you can add that's going to provide at least two of those ingredients. So I think Kelly provided a recipe in her uh, article. Uh, do you remember what your... Uh, recipe was Kelly? Yes, I'm actually looking it up right now to make Perfect. sure that because I think it was um, it was one teaspoon of bleach, mm -hmm. one teaspoon of lemon juice, and two teaspoons of sugar for a quart of warm water. There you go. And so, yeah, I always use the floral design package, but I find if if you're uh, changing the water the way that we want you to, you're going to run out of floral foam really quick. Uh -huh. And so that's an easy way to uh, make it. And that's in the article. And plus it's in the video. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, Candace and I have just, you know, I, it, not having the floral food or not wanting to make the things views like lemon lime soda. Yeah, that's what I was just gonna say. If you don't have those three things to add for that recipe, that would probably be my top choice because you've got the um, sugars in there, you've got some acidity uh, with the the lemon or whatever citrus is in there, and you could even add a splash of bleach. Some people like to do that for the bacteria side part, but. Yeah, honestly, clean water is is going to be great if you're changing it every day. Um, whatever you can do to to lengthen the life, and then also keeping it cool. So, I, like I mentioned, us florists have coolers that we keep the flowers in for periods of time. So, when you get that flower arrangement home, you're not going to want to put it in front of uh, the heating vent. You're not going to want to put it also in, right by the door because cold, freezing cold temperatures is also not good. Um, so yes, keep it away from that direct sunlight, keep it in a nice cool spot, and that's gonna give you the longest life of those uh, as well, yeah. Okay, let me see, I think we had another question. Uh, yeah, okay, another plant question here. Uh, my purple waffle plant uh, continues to have crispy leaf edges, even though the soil is moist, and recently some of the leaves developed yellow spots. And there are leaves that are, those leaves are lighter green in color. It stays in a room with southern windows, but quite far away from the windows. Not sure what I'm doing wrong. Can fertilizer cause that? Any tips on how to combat the issue? Purple waffle plants. 
my first thing would be to pop it out of the pot and look at the roots. And if the roots aren't white, then you might be overwatering it. Mm -hmm. um, that could also cause the, the leaves to be crispy. Um, usually when I water a plant, I always make sure that it needs water. If I feel any weight to the plant, I might wait another day mm -hmm. um, to let it dry down between watering. Again, drying can also cause those. <laughs> True. You know, it's always like it depends in horticulture. <laughs> yeah, it's hard without but, without seeing it and without knowing kind of what the watering schedule is. It can be hard to tell. Yeah. But I think that um, just just to remember this. I think that people have more problems with overwatering plants than they do with underwatering plants. And you want that plant to dry out. Again, look at those roots. If they're not white, that's your problem. Uh -huh. You're overwatering the plant. Um, you, waffle plant. I mean, you could probably prune that baby back to a, a quarter inch of its life, and it would put on brand new growth, and all of that, all of that damage would be gone, uh -huh. and you'd have a beautiful new plant. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, I hope that helps you on that. Okay, I think we're caught up on questions. So if you have a question, we've got a little over five minutes left. Let us know whether it pertains to flowers or blooming house plants or anything else. Um, we'd love to help you. So what else, anything else we were going to touch on this week, guys? Do you think we covered kind of our, most of our bases? We've kind of covered our list. I mean, I'd maybe remind folks to order seeds if you haven't done it. See, I saw a couple articles this week on seed shortages. Mm -hmm. so, hey, yeah. stop it, Ryan. I'm not be if you keep telling people to order their seeds, then I'm not gonna get my seed availability. I'm already well, running into some availability issues of yeah, wanting kind of particular things and not being able to get them. Yeah, I just got my first shipment in, so I'm working on my kind of seed starting schedule now when I'm going to, when I'm going to start stuff. Yeah. It's kind of a self reminder. I haven't ordered anything. so <laughs> I'm, I'm You better get on it, Ryan. Out. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Cause I had to, you know, I've been, you know what, usually I don't start a lot of my stuff from seed. I usually buy transplants. I was a greenhouse girl. I mean, we, that's what we do. We let, let the greenhouse people do it all. But, you know, those of now that, you know, I've been dabbling in more vegetable gardening and now that I'm really interested in sort of the cut flower part that uh, Candace does, I, I want particular cultivars and I'm having issues finding them all. Mm -hmm. And so that's yeah. really the, the benefit of doing seed is to get exactly the kind of tomato you want to grow, exactly the type of celosia you want to grow. Um, yeah, and that's the only reason I do it too. All of, all of these are, are cut flower varieties that some of them I could order as as plugs from a supplier, but for the most, my garden centers, they're certainly not going to have them. So I need to, either need to start them from seed or order in a bulk quantity of plugs. So yeah. and your garden centers are going to have seeds, you guys. Oh yeah, spread. They're just going to have your standard fare. They're not going to have all these interesting and that, uh, that's a bad word to say they are going to have interesting plants right ryan they're just not going to mm -hmm. have what what's the word i'm looking for you guys the niche the niche yeah area. these yeah. kind of yeah niche seeds good job yeah. <laughs> yeah and that's that's probably most of what i'm starting is just some of the favorite tomato and pepper varieties that i can't find at the store but um yeah, I've kind of went away. I used to start a lot of seeds. I've kind of went away from starting as much. We just don't have as easy of a spot to do it anymore. Or, um, gosh, in years past when I was in here a lot, I've started some like right in the office and under grow lights, but not in here enough uh, these days to, to tend to them. Um, so yeah, I mean, in the end for me, if I don't get the seed varieties I want, I'll just buy a few extra of a different tomato plant that, you know, we'll still have fresh tomatoes in the summer. It'll be fine. You know? Yeah. One of the things that I'm experimenting with this year is, you know, I've been, uh, you know, I, I'm a big container gardening when container gardener when it comes to vegetables, but I want to see, you know, how little of containers I can have and still produce vegetables. So 
like for instance, I planted tomatoes in five gallon buckets last year and yeah, they grew, but I really didn't get lots of produce from them. So I'm trying to experiment with other varieties of tomatoes that are four containers and seeing if I can grow them and get lots of produce from them in that little container. So that's really my personal experimentation. I like the idea of carrots too and um, some of these smaller type of like eggplants and um, that are made for containers. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, let's see, we had a question here. Uh, oh, Barb says she's a retired florist and she agrees with all we talked about today. Thank you, Barb. <laughs> good to hear. Um, we get florist approved. Woohoo. Um, John asks, uh, how is it best to water African violets? So you were showing that bottom watering technique yep. earlier. Would you recommend that for African yes, violets? Yes, African violets do not like water on their leaves. Actually, if the, the temperature of the water is too cool, you'll actually kind of burn the leaves in a, in a sense. Uh, you'll get the water marks on the leaves. Uh -huh. So I'm a big bottom water fan. Um, this would be a perfect way to water your African violets. Nice. Well, and while, while we were just talking about seed starting too, bottom watering your seed starting trays is another mm -hmm. another good way to do it too. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. I just you know I just have a tray that's waterproof that all my little cells dip down into, and mm -hmm. that's been the best way because you know if you if you try to pour water into those little trays, um, it can actually splash the seed out sometimes before they're when they're little or before they've drained. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And I think we'll have a whole episode on that coming up. So yeah. stay tuned. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, I think we've gotten through all the questions. So we appreciate everybody for hopping on today. Hopefully you got inspired to head out and do some shopping for Valentine's Day, get some fresh flowers or fresh uh, plants. Um, our next show will be fe February 25th. So we're on this two week, every Thursday schedule. So hopefully that'll help you guys uh, remember to hop on and join us. We're going to be continuing the houseplant conversation, talking about houseplant maintenance. So repotting, dividing, all of that fun stuff that you can start to think about uh, coming up for spring. And then don't forget too, we have our Facebook group, uh, the University of Illinois Extension Horticulture Group on Facebook. You can hop in there and ask questions, share photos, and just commiserate with, with other gardeners in Illinois. So we appreciate you guys. I hope to see you again uh, at our next show and happy Valentine's Day. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Bye.